Well, did you? I did. Greetings, everyone. Nate the Nerdark here from Nerdarchy. Four nerds by nerds, hanging out with a nerd. Nerdark is dead. And today we're going to be talking about the release of Starfinder from uh, Paizo, Pathfinder, normal Pathfinder providers. <laughs> So if you guys uh, want the link to link is in the description. If you want to head over to Amazon and get any kind of awesome Starfinder products, it is an affiliate link. So you know we will get a portion of that sale, but you'll be still be able to get it at the Amazon great price. And there's a lot of stuff that's you know coming out over the next several months. So yeah, yeah, it's a big it's a big launch. So I'm I'm excited because I I saw the game you, that you were in with. Uh, Cody from taking twenty and a few other, a few other uh, players, right? And um, yeah. it was nice to get a sneak peek at it, and it, it was, was it was nice to see the different combat elements as well. Sorry, it is. It's definitely a you know, it's definitely a Pathfinder game. Uh, it's it's built off of that same engine. So if you are really into the the Pathfinder aspect of of the role playing games, then you're gonna absolutely love Starfinder. Um, you know, there's some things that I don't know whether that was unique to Starfinder or whether that's the way it is in Pathfinder as well. I'm not super familiar with the game, but like when you get into like your hit points, you actually have hit points and stamina and it's not until you actually get into like the, the one that that's really where you're taking damage, where stamina, I believe, is just your you know your your fortitude and how much energy you have. That you know that comes you know comes back faster than the actual hit points. Yeah, they did it in a way in which I had wished D and D five e had did it, which is separate the concept of actual damage to your body and hit point damage that isn't actual damage to your body. So, um, because you know they talk about how for like the first. Well, I don't want to get into another game system while we're talking about this one. But anyway, I like the way Starfinder did hit points and stamina and how they how you gain stamina points over time as you level. Right. So it's it's one of those things that like I, I understand that you know fifth edition's reason for doing it being a little bit easier and not wanting to go into that, well, we've got two different things, but it would make for certain types of spells that you could say, oh well. If I want to go straight to hit point damage, that could be crazy. Hmm. Yes. So, uh, where did you want to start off with? Um, uh, I figured. Of... I figured. Uh, you know, we could talk about the fact that, um, you know, Starfinder does kind of sort of have a a background, like like Fifth Edition has. So you've got the ability to choose a background, you got you have the ability to choose a race, and you have the ability to choose a class. So I figured we could go into, you know, those things so that people could, you know, even if they don't have the book yet, you know, we could kind of help them make their first character choices, uh, you know, and that'll probably round out our, uh, you know, our hour. How do you feel about that, sir? Uh, that sounds good to me. So. I actually have the PDF here, so we'll wind up doing some screen shares. Uh, uh, so let's see here. Yeah, I have to wrangle some people, so I'll be right back. Yep. All right, so we get into character creation, and their background things they call themes. So uh, let me grab to the right spot first. One second, gentlemen, and... All right, here we go. So I will do a screen share. All right, so here you have what they call their themes. And you have Ace Pilot, you know, it's as, as you would expect. This is, this is going to be the type of character that is meant to be the, the pilot of a ship. The, the Star Wars FFG series, they actually have a class that's called Ace Pilot, so you could definitely go down go down that road. Uh, but this just kind of all of these things kind of flavor your character uh, in a way that's different from Fifth Edition. Five E says like, oh well, what did you do prior to? This is how do you want to flavor the actual 
class and character. Bounty hunter, that's you know, it's gonna be what it is. You know, you're you're out to, to track people down as as you would expect. Uh, icon, you've you've done something of renown, so people actually know who you are. Um, you know, so this would kind of be close to your folk hero. Uh, now, again, all of these things will have the ability to alter your class because they give you a stat, they give you some other things. Um, so it can really help you define your character. You have mercenary, outlaw, priest, scholar, spacefarer, spacefarer, xeno seeker. Um, you know, there's a there's a big difference between spacefarer and xeno seeker, although they might sound similar. A spacefarer is you're looking to go new places, so for you it's more about the travel and where you go. Whereas the Xeno Seeker is more about actually making contact with you know new life forms and and that so it's more like charisma based if you will and then here's something that they found or that they did that you know is kind of kind of unique or you know new they have a they have themeless so it's like oh you don't want a theme here you go you can just make your character theme themeless so you're going to get a uh since all of them give you some kind of skill here all right you've got you know gain, gain a class skill of your choice when you create a themeless character and you're going to be able to get an ability adjustment to anything that you want as opposed to the other themes that give you specific stuff and then as you gain gain levels you're going to get those specific powers um once per day before you roll a skill check you can gain plus two bonus to that skill Extensive studies, choose a skill that is a class skill for you once per day. You can reroll one such skill check. You've got to take the, the second result. Uh, and then at 18th level, increase your, your pool of resolve points by one. Now, it specifically calls out that if you decide to go with a themeless character, they're telling you straight up that the stuff that you get for being themeless is less powerful than what's in those other. Uh, nine choices so do it at your own risk and it literally you know says that a themeless character is considered less powerful than a character with a theme so this so choose this option with care so i, I kind of thought that was uh that was pretty interesting yeah well uh, they're calling it out that it's not it's not as good yeah you want to only pick that if you absolutely don't have another thing that would go well with your stuff now uh, we'll get into this, you know, this part later. Um, but one of the things that I thought was fantastic was during uh, the actual class breakdowns, they actually give you, for lack of a better word, archetype. So it's like, oh, well, I want to mix, you know, this class with this theme, and this is the rule book's derivation of what the two of them, you know, make. And I, I kind of thought that that was, that was really awesome because then while looking through the classes, you could be like, oh, well, here's an idea for a character. And each of them already has a picture right there. So if you really love what's right there, you could be like, okay, well, I've got my race, my class, and my theme picked just from just looking at that. What was your opinion on that, Nate? Uh, I actually really enjoyed uh, the the complexity of it that you had you had a theme that pretty much felt like it could have been a class as well but they didn't I like that they didn't attach I, I like how for example like ace an ace pilot doesn't have to be a fighting class right you could be an ace pilot and be an icon or like a diplomat or something like that or some yeah. other well, no, I might be getting. I'm, I have to look at the rule book. But you know, you know, like a mechanic, you could be a pilot, and a mechanic, or you could be any of the other actual classes and be an ace pilot. So it was. Um, I I always dislike how they how they how some um, future games would do that, where it was kind of like. You know, the fighting class had an archetype that was the ace pilot, and it's like, well, what if you just really like ships and you want to be a pilot, <laughs> and you also happen to do X, Y, or Z? Right. So it gives it. It's a nice mix because that means you can have an ace pilot that is, you know, five or six things, and then you could also have an icon that's five or six things, and 
So you got you actually have a lot of classes available to you if you think about a theme married to an actual class as being a separate a separate like class in and of itself. Right. So was there a, was there a particular theme that you uh, that that you really relished, or you you were like, oh, for my first character, I'd prefer to go down this road. I had a I don't know I liked a lot of them. Okay. <laughs> I did like a lot of different ones. The um, I kind of thought it was going to be interesting to check out. I think the the icon theme. Okay. Like I said, I'm still getting used to using this book, so it's like uh, um for the screen share. The icon is one of the themes, right? It's not a class. Right. Yes. So, so I for... like I like the icon. It was I was like, oh, this would be interesting to kind of play play this kind of person uh going through life and being able to be recognized by people and how that's actually good and bad at the same time. <laughs> well, I mean that, that's that's always the always the case. There's not nothing's ever a win-win situation. Um now like for the game that I did, you know, with with uh, Owen and the other uh, YouTube personalities. I was a spacefarer, and that's what I'm I'm looking at here. So for becoming a spacefarer, that that choice it's going to give you plus one to Constitution. You know, that's set. First level, you get theme knowledge. You're obsessed with distant worlds, and you always mentally catalog everything you learn about new and strange places that you can recall it when you need it most. Additionally, you can use your knowledge of biology and topology to inure yourself to alien hazards, reduce the DC of physical science checks, to recall knowledge about strange new worlds or features of space by five. Physical science is a class skill for you, though if it is a though if it is a class skill from the class you take at first level, you instead gain a plus one bonus to physical science checks. In addition, you gain an ability adjustment of plus one to constitution at character creation. And again, that's noted, you know, up above, you know, here. So, and then of course, you know, as with the themeless thing, you get a bonus at sixth level, twelfth level, eighteenth level. So I kind of thought that that was that was pretty pretty interesting, uh, you know. Whereas your fifth edition characters, when you choose a background, like none none of it's giving you any stat bonuses. It's giving you some mechanical stuff and some role play stuff. Like, there's no role play feature here per se. It's you know you're getting bonuses to for this choice. You're getting bonuses on on your skills. Well, there is. It's kind of like the RP happens because of the direction in which, like, uh, for an icon, for example, there is you know as you level up you become more and more, I guess, well-known. And <laughs> what happens is over time, that's, you know, that causes certain things to mechanically happen, but it's going to cause certain things to happen just in general. I mean, like walking down the street, uh, they talk about like how you will just be recognized by a certain number of people, just like as you, like as based on like the level of you as an icon. Mm -hmm. And um, that, that just completely transforms that character's interaction with the world. Right. So I'm not even interested in, like, I don't care that I get a plus or something. I like the, I like all the, it's like, you know, um, taking a feature and getting some, like, henchmen that don't do anything except hold your stuff. That's cool. You I mean, nothing else gives you that. Like, so in this case, you know, nothing else is going to give you that kind of, um, that celebrity status, well known for some kind of field. I mean, it, you can marry that to whatever field you are. So if you're a mechanic and you're an icon, maybe you're maybe you developed something or made um, a, a new AI that does a particular you know X Y Z. I mean, like you know, we know, a lot of people know who made Facebook, right? And could recognize him, but you know, he's you know like a nerd that coded stuff <laughs> and had an idea for what he wanted to do, and he did it. So like right. that kind of you could be an icon and be that depending on your class, depending on your history and stuff like that. So that's all. So it's not RP in the sense. Um, it's just not like it's not like following one of the pillars of, you know, this is just for role play. There's a lot of benefits that you get in game. And that's what I noticed the big difference between Pathfinder and Starfinder and things like fifth edition is that you have fifth edition just kind of like will say something, but then not give a statistical benefit. 
And a lot of times, Pathfinder and now Starfinder, you're seeing like all the icon stuff. They're all RP stuff, but they also give you a statistical benefit, like 10% discount at places and things of that nature. And that is just showing like the mathematics of the natural progression of RP for the icon. So look at, looking at uh, looking at the icon then, since you know we keep uh, keep mentioning it. I like it a lot. I don't even know what I'd play with. I just know I want to be that, and then like, because it seems like a per like it's like you're it's like you're giving a positive and a negative. You're getting right a situation. And and you know we, you know we we kind of glossed over the stats like uh, like you know the previous editions of D and D. You know, this follows the suit of Pathfinder, where races still have statistical negatives during character creation. Mm -hmm. So we'll get into we'll get into that you know more when we get into races. But so Icon, you know, thanks to interstellar transmissions and drift travel, the galaxy is smaller than ever, and this connectivity has facilitated your ascension to celebrity status. You might be a famous performer or a celebrated scientist, but either way, you get recognized on the path worlds and in associated system. Systems. Your reasons for traveling to unknown worlds might be to further spread your acclaim or to escape the limelight. So you get a you know plus one to charisma, as one would expect, uh, and then choose a profession skill. You are hooked deeply into the culture of your iconic profession. When attempting a profession or culture check to recall knowledge about other icons of your profession or details about your profession's cultural aspects, increase the DC by five. Uh, you gain... Uh, plus one bonus to checks of your chosen profession skill. Culture also becomes a class skill for you, though if it's already a skill, you get a plus one bonus to it. In addition, you gain an ability adjustment to your charisma score. So I like that. That is kind of cool. And as you said, you know, later on, you know, people begin to automatically notice you. Uh, and as as we do screen shares, just you know, check out the the, the really fantastic art. I, I'm a big fan of just about every single piece of artwork that's that's in this book. Uh, yes, they did such a good job on the clothing because I like whenever I see sci-fi stuff, I'm like, all right, how much effort did they think about like they put into thinking about like making this look futuristic or making this look outside of the norm of the way you know normal fashion on our on Earth is? And I think they did a fantastic job of that. Right. So we actually got a question from Zerif Gaming, uh, and he wants to know like what separates Starfinder from other sci-fi role-playing games like Fantasy Flight Star Wars. Uh, so that that's a really big question. So I would say like every single game that I'm aware of that does, hey, it's space. So whether you're talking about you know rifts, you know in space whether you're talking about Fantasy Flight Star Wars, whether you're talking about, you know, D&D Spelljammer, whether you're talking about, um, you know, Starfinder, or whether you're talking about, you know, any of the other other derivations thereof that, that you could just use a blanket, uh, blanket rule set like Cypher System, Fate, every single one of those rule sets is just completely different. So if you want to play you know, uh, D and D and put it in space, you know, you could ignore all of the aspects of technology because we don't have any technology rules for fifth edition. If you want to get into, you know, the nitty gritty of star Wars, you, you know, you can do so and you can do so with a very complex dice mechanic and it requires the, the real knowledge of that dice and you have to be able to um, you have you have to think outside the box with Star Wars in a very particular manner. And we've used this uh, example, or I've used this example before, but I'm I'm playing in a Star Wars game, kind of been on hold for the last month and a half. But my character is is a mechanic. You know, he's he's the ship's engineer. When things go bad, he's got to fix it. Well, we're in an Imperial ship. And we're trying, you know, on a mission for the Alliance, and we're trying to destroy a, you know, a series of prototype TIE fighters. Now, I, I'm, I'm dexterous, I'm intelligent, 
but I don't have any heavy weapons because I don't have the strength to wield them. So if I'm going to fire my blaster pistol at, a, at an advanced TIE fighter, I'm not going to do enough damage to actually make, you know, ma make any kind of, you know, note of damage on it. So I was like, okay, well, I don't, I don't know what I can actually do. So Mike, the DM steps up and says, oh, well, you know, there's an access panel right here. You can make a mechanics check or a computers check and, you know, have, have a crane pick up a crate and drop it on the ship. It's like, oh, well, I'll do that then. <laughs> my, my most powerful attack is now crane attack. <laughs> so I, I get to do that. And sure enough, I roll well enough with the dice. You know, I have a, you know, four intellect. I, you know, difficulty was only three. I completely break the ship. Uh, yes, Bill, but, you know, while, while I do have a, you know, mechanic of Bunny, uh, you know, my Star Wars character and Bunny, I think, are vastly different types of characters. Um, Were they both yeah. named Bunny? No, no. Uh, okay. I actually, it's been so long since I played my Star Wars dude, I, I could not tell you what his name is off the top of my head. I think we've only played like two sessions, maybe three. Either way, so the dice and the mechanics of Star Wars, the leveling of Star Wars, make it a vastly different rule set and game that you couldn't have those kind of things happen in Pathfinder. You know, you're, you're not going to have people say, oh, well, can I attack this guy with my intelligence while using my sword? That's just not... <laughs> That that's just not the way uh, the way it goes. <laughs> yes, lo love you too, Bill. I know I know you're just messing. Um, so like, it doesn't matter the the you know it doesn't matter what the rule set is. You can play any kind of style game, but the rule set does dictate the flow of events and how you handle certain problems. So that that's to me uh, Zareft Gaming how Star Wars and Starfinder are going to be vastly different. You know, the, the way you go about dealing with challenges, the way the system interacts with all of, you know, the different elements of the game. I think, you know, if you had an adventuring party in both rule sets and you asked, okay, you know, Starfinder players, how are you going to handle this, this situation? And if you asked the Star Wars, you know, players, how are you going to handle this situation? While, yes, combat might be an angle, even how combat handles is going to be different. Uh, but I think you're going to get two different distinct sets of options to deal with that problem. All right, David Bliss. So is Starfinder hard to understand as someone who has only played D&D? Okay. I would say Starfinder, like Pathfinder, is a, is a big commitment ahead of time in making your character. Um, especially if you want to take in the big sweeping scope of all the things you could do. Um, so I would say what makes, what makes, I would say, Starfinder and Pathfinder both easier to understand and very similar to D&D is if you think of a concept you want to play and then say, all right, talk to somebody who's more experienced and say, how do I play this type of character I want to play in Pathfinder or Starfinder? So... Um, because like I was looking, like I'm thinking of playing an icon. I'm like, well, I saw, uh, I only saw one thing in the, um, in the, I think it's the Mystic. It's like Memory Palace or something like that. It's like, all right. I mean, I already kind of knew I liked Mystics, so heck, why not? <laughs> so I'm gonna my first character that I play in Starfinder whenever we play is gonna be uh, an icon Mystic, and that's just, I, I don't even care how um, I don't care if that plus one charisma actually matters for the Mystic class. I don't know. It doesn't matter because the type of character I'm going to play is going to be, you know, a major part of of the game for me, rather than you know one extra plus or one extra minus. And I guess if it's easy to play if you're not a gamist about it, I guess is what I'm going to say about it. Because otherwise, <laughs> you, if you're if you're gamist and you're super into the 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 plus grit, like getting as many pluses on something and super optimizing a character, you could spend months trying to design a character, you know, and learning the game. But if you're just into playing a character um, concept and you just play it within the rules that is, are present, I think it's a lot easier to go around. It's really overwhelming to try and 
learn an entire an entire uh, rule book series. It's kind of like the first time you maybe played D and D. You might have got stuck playing a fighter or a thief or something, um, because it's easier to just roll dice and interact with hit points and stuff like that, rather than also try and learn spells and figure out how spell mechanics work and all that kind of stuff and how many spells you get. That would normally be included if you're like, oh well, you could play any of these series of classes. So similarly, you know. Uh, Starfinder can be, I think, really overwhelming if you're trying to take everything in the book and figure out what you wanted to play out of that. So rather, uh, rather than think of an idea and then try and find the rule that fits your idea. So my my uh, you know answer to David is it is going to be more complex for you to pick it up, but the fact that you know some of the the core from fifth edition it's built on some similarities uh you know pathfinder is built off of the engine of dnd's 3.5 and then starfinder is built on top of pathfinder now i am not going to say in any way shape or form i am not an expert on pathfinder i've only played like three or four sessions of it and that was you know years ago so I have no expertise there. I did play 3.5 for about 10 years, long time ago. So there is some things that I'm familiar with and some things that I'm not. Now, Starfinder is, you know, brand new. I did get to play a session of it, uh, which was, you know, fantastic. Uh, and I, I think that the other guys who made characters, I think they put more, you know, knit and grit into making a well-designed character. I went with, this sounds like fun, and I made this dude because that's what I'm used to for 5th edition. And I don't feel my character was as, uh, as useful to the, rest of, to the rest of the party, although I had a blast playing. So for me, that's all that matters. Um, so if you want to get in, I would suggest, as Nate says, you, know, you make a character and see how it goes, and then you'll slowly learn you know, what is different from Starfinder from 5th edition, and you'll pick up things as you go. Uh, and, and playing is usually the best way to learn. I, mean, I know it is for me, just sitting there reading a rule book uh, is not as much fun as, okay, how do I do X? How, how can I do such and such? And somebody who knows the game kind of spells it out, and then you kind of get clarifications, and you know, well, why it works that way or how it works that way and you you, you research as you're going so did mm -hmm. uh did, did, do we want to get into uh into races uh, i believe so um that would be good <laughs> if we do if we do a little bit of you know, we did we talked about the icons i say let's go into races and then we can kind of like try and talk with classes a little bit before before we end this, before we um, run out of time, before we run out of time, we could do like a five hour stream probably on the intro to to Pathfinders uh, to Starfinder stuff. Well, and and we're probably going to do some more Starfinder videos over the next several weeks uh, to to really share stuff out. So if you're looking for more you know in depth stuff, you know feel free to stay tuned. We'll we'll get into it. Uh, so you have seven races to choose from within the Starfinder book. Now, depending upon, you know, how much of you want to get into uh, Galerion or however you want to pronounce that and, and the world that, you know, mysteriously disappeared, you know, you, your DM might allow you to play, you know, more of the Pathfinder stereotypical races, but I don't think they're going to be, um, you know, completely balanced into the Starfinder system uh, because they're not incorporated within the technology and what have you. So, you know, um, you want to play Drow in space, Ted. You know, you want to play Drow in space. I don't know. I mean, there's a lot of really great races within within these. So that's true. You've got, you've got androids. Uh, you know, as you can you know see on the the list here. Uh, I, I tried to actually get the the Starfinder you know, picture as our thumbnail, but, you know, Dave's the one that normally does this stuff, and I just haven't learned the ins and the outs that, that he does. Um, 
but you know you've got androids as you would expect it's a you know part mechanical part biological and you were created by humans but you're now free to do as you want we've got humans you know as you would expect because humans are everywhere and it says it says so right there <laughs> found nearly every anywhere in the packed worlds uh now the rest of these things i'm uh you know probably going to butcher what the proper pronunciation is so uh, feel free to correct me if you know that I'm wrong. So we have Kasathus, and it's an ancient four-armed race from a distant star system. Uh, they're pretty cool, and it does specifically call out that, hey, you've got four arms, but that doesn't give you any more actions to, to do stuff. So I thought that was pretty cool. You've got uh, Lashuntus, uh, naturally gifted psychics divided into uh, two subraces. One tall and lean, the other short and powerful. <coughs> Excuse me. So they kind of have a uh, you know a, a sub race system set up similar to uh, fifth edition. Well, and they've got a really interesting thing. They're actually it's one race, but um, they have like this genetic dimorphism um, based on situation. Right. So like the environment can actually shape um, the type of. Um, subspecies you become pretty interesting absolutely uh so then we've got shirins uh this is the first time i'm ever actually seeing an insect race that doesn't have lots of hard consonants in the name uh i don't know if that's appealing to anybody else but i thought it was worth mentioning uh once part of a terrifying hive mind that devoured all in its path the insectile Shirins mutated and broke away to become independent but community-minded individuals dedic addicted to the freedom of choice. So Shirins and Lashuntas both have access to telepathy. So I kind of thought that was that was pretty neat. Uh, fifth edition kind of, uh, you know, with the, the Warlock uh, one pact gives you access to telepathy, but now we're actually seeing it at, at a race level, which I thought was pretty cool. I like that it actually is more than one. It basically, where it was appropriate, they had telepathy mm -hmm. rather than being like, oh, we'll just have this one race be like the mystic race and then that's it. Right. Which is normally which, what happens in sci fi stuff. But I, I like funny. to see it different. Which is funny because that while they say it's a naturally gifted psychics, there is no psionics or, you know, psychic abilities in the actual core rulebook. So I thought that was amusing. Uh, we have Vesk. I did not. <laughs> Oh, I know you didn't find it amusing. I, I, I know you always want to play that, that type. Well, not always want to play, but you're drawn to that type of character. Uh, we have Vesk. Here's your, your reptilian race. Um, you know, they're, they're strong. They're powerful. They're uh, resistant to fear, which is kind of cool. Uh, that's actually what I wound up playing in the, the, the promo game that I got to play. Uh, and then we have Yosoki. However you want to pronounce that one, and that's uh, you know small rat people, and they they are in fact small of the races. They're the ones that actually are size small. And had Dave actually gotten to play in the promo game instead of myself, he was actually going to play one of them, and he had this whole concept figured out of what he wanted to do with them. So yeah, I thought that was uh. You know the races are are pretty darn cool in my opinion. Uh, as many of them that I'm like, yeah, what what could I do with them? How would I how would I import them to fifth edition? <laughs> oh yeah, I oh especially the with the the last the ones that have the dimorphism. Yeah, I like the, those people. Lashuntas. Yeah. I'm trying to grab my so. PDF. <laughs> uh, and then I'm like, so, oh, wait, I'm not on the same page as Ted. Dang it. <laughs> Uh, so, you know, as you would expect, you know, there's the, the, the races, you know, they have their own breakdown uh, and, and it typically boils down to you get a plus two overall to your stats, similar to the way, you know, fifth edition, you know, leans towards in some cases. But, you know, like androids get a plus two to dex, plus two to intelligence, minus two to charisma. But your actual race is what dictates how many hit points you have, uh, at least to start. And then you you get, as you would expect, a variety of different abilities, just like every other you know thing is. 
Uh, you know, androids are constructed, so they get a plus two racial bonus against disease, mind influencing, mind affecting effects, poison, sleep, uh, unless there's something that specifically targets constructs. They have low light vision out to 60 feet. Uh, they have a minus two to sense motive checks, but sense motive checks on them, the DCs are increased by two because they're androids and they don't really care about emotions. Uh, and then because they're upgradable, uh, you you can because you can upgrade armor and and things in this game. They're considered to have an upgrade slot in their bodies, as if it was like a light light armored thing. So they essentially have a free upgrade space that they can put something in. So I think that that's pretty cool. I, I like that uh, that mechanic because it's not something that actually exists in. Uh, you know, fifth edition. There's no way to. Oh, well, let me make this thing better. Sort of making it magical. So, um, was that just an example, or you didn't want? To, did you want to go into all the races, or did you want to um, head on the? Well, classes? I mean, I, I think I think classes are going to, to going to take a lot more time. Um, we'll give an overview of them. So uh, it's you know twelve forty I think uh, are are we are, are we going to stick through to uh, our typical thing and do a roll call or no, do we skip, skip it? it? All right, so so sorry guys, no no roll call today because we're gonna get heavily into you know Starfinder some more uh, since we're down down on time. So voila, we have classes and you know seven seems to be there you know. Pretty uh, strong number here. We have Envoy, Mechanic, Mystic, Operative, Solarian, Soldier, and Technomancer. So Nate and I were kind of discussing this uh, offline, and this is one of those things where uh, it's pretty interesting because a lot of these classes don't correspond directly to any like previous class that that's out there you know how, how do you feel about that nate uh that's one of the things i like the best actually is um i looked at the envoy and when i started reading the envoy i was like oh it's kind of like a rogue and they're like oh wait but it gets all these fighter powers like some kind of battle master and like but then it also has all this negotiating politics po you know possibilities like a like like a bard it's like a future bard <laughs> but it's also a fighter but it's also this so it's like I'm just gonna try and stop. I'm just gonna stop comparing it to fantasy D and D. It's not gonna work. <laughs> so you have to look at the fact that once technology enters into the fray, the 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 world changes. In fifth edition, or in sorry, in fantasy, the bulk of what you have going on is people in a little bit of armor with a little bit of weapon training that are going to do the bulk of your fighting. Well, any time technology advances to such, a, to such a degree that you're traveling the stars and colonizing places with that technology comes a whole new development. So your soldier, you know, your, your person who is going to do the fighting, they're going to be strapping on armor, but instead of pulling out, you know, some kind of melee weapon, the first go-to is usually, you know, some kind of big gun. And it's, you know, it's present in Starship Troopers. It's present in Warhammer 40K. You know, it, it's present in, you know, Star Wars with, you know, the, the, uh, the Stormtroopers. So, like, that's going to be your soldier. This is the person who is heavily lined, lined for war. So they're going to get heavy armor, which I actually think they're the only ones that do. Um, you know, and then of course they're going to have all the weapons. So they're, they're your fighter, but the style fighter is very different in a sci-fi game than your typical, uh, you know, fantasy game. You know, Nate, Nate kind of touched on Envoy. Um, and, you know, you could loosely say it might be your battle bard, but it's got so many different things that it could do, it does kind of break away from that. 
the mechanic an absolute necessity where technology is involved, like the closest thing you could possibly consider that one to be in a fantasy thing might be like an alchemist because they tinker with, with tools and things. Um, but there's no actual uh, alchemist class in fifth edition. So there's, there's really no corollary to 5e. Uh, we, we move on to mystic and you could loosely say that this is your cleric, but in so many ways, it's not. Uh, it, it's 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 just so very different in in the in the spectrum of what the the universe has to offer. That like I don't think there's there's any kind of corollary, and it does say you know often through a focus of divine or intuitive understanding of biological systems. Yeah, this is uh, a mashup of like um uh like it's like the mashup of psionics, monk, not like the fighting aspect so much, but the other things you get from monk and like maybe a little bit of cleric kind of feel to it. So again, it's like when you start describing a class as three or more classes, it's kind of like, well, they're not really use useful descriptive wise. Mm -hmm. So next we move on to operative. Now, having had you know time to actually sit and look at, at the classes as opposed to just the, the brief concept of you know make a character for this game uh, I like I'm leaning heavily towards wanting to make an operative I think they're they're far more intriguing to me than the other classes and at first you know the onset is like oh well this is clearly you know your rogue this is the the, the skill heavy class that requires stealth. Well, that sounds like it should absolutely be a rogue. But when you start to like look down at other things that they can do, they're they're definitely more, you know, you know, in line to to be more like a fighting rogue. So like it doesn't like it doesn't forces. Yeah, like that's you know that's that's what it would be. Like you're talking about you know someone who would be on a special forces team, and. No one looks at them and says, "Oh, well, those guys are rogues." Like, they're so like here. You kind of have a mixture of fighter, ranger, and rogue, you know, mi mixed in. So, Solarian, this, uh, you know, this is what I actually played in the the promo game, and really enjoyed it. I love the theme of what's there, and maybe the race and class I chose didn't really mix well together or you know whatever have you but I didn't feel that I, that that was up to the snuff of what everyone else was was doing uh, but the Solarian contemplates and gains power from the life cycle of stars his techniques allow him to create a weapon or suit of armor from a moat of stellar energy and depending upon what type of energy you're using dictates what the thing looks like. And of course, you know, whether you've chosen a weapon or armor dictates, you know, what it is and what it does for you. Uh, I thought it was cooler to look like I had a magic weapon than, than to have the armor. But I think the armor is actually a more powerful option. So I, I don't know how, uh, you know, how other people who have, looked at or managed to, to play solarians uh you know have have looked at but you know that that's my that's my feedback on actually uh you know having played one for a session and then last but not least is our technomancer oh sorry well, let's let's complete more on on solarian uh we actually had a conversation with owen you know the, the guy who ran the the, the promo game uh, we had him on for a live chat afterwards, and it was very interesting because the Solarian, it does consider like strength and charisma as your prime stats, because charisma affects your your magic aspects of the of your your uh, your modes of energy, but at the same time, uh, Owen thought it more of a fighting class, so he saw it more as a ranger. I saw it more as a as a paladin because, you know, 
ah, you're getting you're getting energy from somewhere else, you know, the celestial bodies sometimes are referred to as divine. So I'm like, oh, well, this is a paladin. You're, you you got strength, charisma. That's clearly what it's got to be. So it's it's very interesting to see the different dynamics of not dynamics, but the different interpretations of you know the 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 two you know the two of us and how we saw saw that class uh, reacting to the other other sets. And I in the chat have come up with Star Druid Jedi Lantern as description <laughs> for the Solarian. Star Jedi Druid Lantern. Okay. Nice. I uh I'll have to I'll have to jot that one down and you know use that somewhere. So then getting back to what I said, last but not least is the Technomancer. Now here the Technomancer understands connections between technology and magic and exploits them by bending reality to suit her needs. Now of all of the descriptions, that um in my opinion is by far the most the most uh, cool and powerful bending reality to suit her needs. I mean, come on, man, who doesn't want to be able to do that? So there's a lot of fun stuff that's that's there. You, chill, there, you still a, totally skip soldier. No, I, I said soldier first. Oh, you went over soldier first. Oh, I missed yeah. that part. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we're rounding out on the hour. Uh, is there anything else that we'd want to kind of get out there about Starfinder? Well, where to, it's where to find Starfinder first. Well, I, you know, I said this in the beginning, but in case you tuned in late, should you be looking to get Starfinder or any of the, you know, other many Starfinder products that are going to be coming out between now and the end of the year, the link is in the description below. Again, I will point out that uh, that it is an affiliate link. You'll still get your you know, great Amazon price, and we get a small, you know, portion of that of that sale. Uh, so I don't know whether any of you guys have managed to, you know, pick it up yet. Whether you've seen other people talking about it, you know, are you guys excited to be able to play Starfinder? I know Dave's copy is, you know, in the mail. I've already got the PDF here, and it's just, you know. Yeah, it, it's just as I said, it's it's an amazing set of art. It's a great set of rules. Uh, having played, you know, uh, a handful of Spelljammer sessions with Dave, there that's Spelljammer as Dave is running is literally just D and D in space. You know, there's no uh, technology to actually work with, whereas Starfinder. Um, you know, it incorporates all of that technology. So, so it's it's a great way to actually get into that nitty gritty. And you know, you know the the rule set is, is there. And some people I know, you know, run away from Pathfinder because they've enjoyed the rules light stuff of Fifth Edition. But there's nothing to say that you couldn't like tone down and allow some of the more 5th edition isms into a Starfinder game or into a Pathfinder game? Oh, I, I wanted to quickly kind of share a bit of the art of uh, the spaceship stuff since I feel oh, like, yeah. I mean, d you know, we were talking about D&D in space. It's like, it's, it's a pretty big deal. <laughs> um, so let's see. Hopefully I'm doing this right. Okay, so just to give you, I'm, we're doing a quick overview. This could be just, we could probably take a few of these ships and go an hour and talk about them. So <laughs> uh, let's try and find the beginning of this. That's not faster. So as you can see, I'm kind of zipping through the different ships. So there's a lot of awesome uh, art for this. And um, they all have, uh, here, we'll just stop at this one because it's kind of creepy and cool looking. So the Blackwind Sepulcher, pretty awesome name. And Gives you a, a Death's Head Necro Glider, and so here's the ship, and it talks about the the you know crew, uh, the power core, uh, the type type of systems it has on it. Uh, you can say like MP3 de defenses. That's going to be someplace else. Whether or not it can be expanded, um, all the like what tier it is. They got like the tier 14, tier five, and the different things it has on it. Whether it's um, 
the type of engines, different modifiers that go along with it, all this, um, all the different skills and rankings for things, and then what it can attack with on different parts of it. So as you can see, it's got you know port, starboard, forward, all these different, uh, um, basically regions that it can attack when it's either traveling around or moving around. It's got the hit points and everything, the what it need, what's required to hit it, all that kind of stuff. And um, no, I, I let me jump in real quick. We didn't actually do any ship to ship battle in in our in our promo game. That's one of the things that was you know a, l a little sad, uh, you know. The, the system is is really cool and you can see from those amazing ships and the, you know Nate, Nate sharing that they've really put a lot of thought into that so I, I can't really comment as to whether the ship to ship battle is better or worse than say the the, the Star Wars FFG system uh, I will touch one thing on on combat that I wanted to share that I thought was amazing is your actual armors that you can buy actually have like a melee rating and an energy rating. So you actually have two distinct armor classes. So I thought that was pretty cool. Yeah. And here's some just an example type of maneuvers that you can be expected to do. Uh, and I know that, you know, there's going to be checks for these. <laughs> so that's when the ACE pilot comes in handy. Cause as they gain levels, they don't, even if they fail, they don't they don't catastrophically fail things as much. So there's there's things that'll come up and and here's some just different maneuvers and what they give you and give you you know you're on the hex grid. Oh uh, yeah, Azeroth Gaming. Uh, it sounds complicated. I bet it is until you learn how it goes. Um, because well, let's say in comparison, the, um, story the storytelling dice in a Fantasy Flight game for Star Wars that is more of like you're rolling dice and then describing what happened rather this is going to be a, a higher level more like miniatures game involved you know what i mean like i would i would think that this would be one of the harder things to do theater of the mind with because of all the things you'd have to control even if you only had a couple ships each and you know it talks about speed uh, the different speeds the, the stunts the piloting checks involved in the speed and then all the different like what you get for all the different maneuvers that it just showed. So there's quite a lot. It's it's basically like it just you you've got another set of rules for combat in ships and what happens when they get damaged. The difference between things like um, getting a critical hit and what it does to different systems. So you have this critical hit here and the chance of doing um, different things like damage to weapon array, engines, power core, uh, life support sensors. So it's it's got that kind of, yes, you know, it's got that space combat feel. The ship's so huge, a part of it takes damage, and rather than just subtracting from its overall hit points, and then later it explodes, you know, it's it's taking damage gradually to different systems and different functions, and getting wrecked and and malfunctioning in different ways. And there's you know, mechanic is really useful because that can help um, fix parts on a ship quickly when needed. So having a mechanic involved could be something that kind of like having a mechanic on your ship can kind of save your ship in really bad times. So, and it talks about crew actions and all the different things that the crew can do as part of their action phase while they're in the ship, rather than, well, I usually swing this stellar ax, so I'm just going to stand here while we're fighting this other ship. There's stuff that you can do and get involved with through that. So that is like super super extreme quickly quick check out of the uh, the ship combat stuff and the ships so i just want to share that since it was um so the wind the, pathfinder uh starfinder the the book is massive uh so like it would actually take a long time to to go through and show you know all the different stuff that's there but if you look at that that link that that I previously shared, or that that's down below, you'll see that there's actually a lot of stuff that's already planned. So I really feel that, um, you know, Paizo has a lot of confidence in what they're doing with this. And you know, while some people are like, ah, you know, I'm I'm you know fantasy through and through, you know, this might actually bring other people into a you know a better uh, 
not not a better, but more. It'll bring more people into you know the RPG community uh, that are willing to try a D20 based system. You know, somebody might branch out from Star Wars to Starfinder and what have you. Mm, great uh, question, Red Jackal. Um, yes, I would say that the ship combat is more like BattleTech, where uh, you know your mech might get a weapon destroyed or something blasted off and it becomes useless. Um, you know, if your engine hits, you're going to move slower, similar to like if you lose a leg or take a lot of damage to your leg in Battletech. So I would say it's going to be similar in that aspect. So that's a, it's a poison. Uh, I imagine, uh, I, again, I haven't actually looked through the, the section on, um, you know, scanning and what kind of op options you have access to. But I would imagine that you would be able to scan the other person's ship, find out you know where different zones are, and be able to target uh, engines or you know what munitions or whatever have you. Uh, and you know if the rules don't say that you can, then check your DM. They might they might say that you can. Because <laughs> I I always think that you know just blowing up the other guy. That's not enough options for me. There's sometimes it's like, oh, well, can we disable them so that we can go in and do a rescue mission or, you know, do a, uh, you know, you know, dis disable their sensors so that we can have a hidden landing party in an invisible pod ship that's going to latch on to go in and do a stealth mission. You know, the, you don't want to do anything that's actually going to limit your options, in my opinion. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't see the the express rules for called shots on ships, but I bet. I mean, there's called shots in Pathfinder, so I'm assuming that it's significant enough. And again, a ship is large enough. That, and yes, um, and yes, Red Jackal, take the ship is absolutely another uh, another thing that you know you'd want to be able to do, so that you know it's like okay, that's another reward, right? We get to, we get to keep the ship and sell it. I mean. For spacecraft, even in a post-scarcity world where you're like, oh, everything's kind of taken care of, ships are still a tremendous amount of investment of energy and materials and things like that. And this isn't post-scarcity. This is, you know, still, you know, there's the nitty-gritty of people trying to survive in this in this uh, space-faring society. So a ship is super valuable, regardless of how many there are in the sky. Yes, David, that that's that's the game. Building a pirate fleet would be a cool game idea. <laughs> Time to build a Death Star. All right, so uh, it's, we, we've we've crossed that threshold. Uh, you know, we can get back into more Starfinder once Dave comes back and we figure out, you know, you know what videos we want to do on this. Um, you know, it's a uh, you know it's a cool system. I'm certain that at some point in time. You know, the, the Nerdarchy crew will get a Starfinder game going up on the channel. We just have to find somebody who's going to run it. So uh, with that, until next time, guys, stay, stay nerdy. nerdy. Uh, let me grab to the right spot first. One second, gentlemen. and. All right, here we go. So I will do a screen share. All right, so here you have what they call their themes, and you have Ace Pilot. You know, it's as as you would expect. This is this is going to be the type of character that is meant to be the, the pilot of a ship. The, the Star Wars FFG series. They actually have a class that's called Ace Pilot, so you could definitely go down go down that road. Uh, but this just kind of all of these things kind of flavor your character uh, in a way that's different from Fifth Edition. Five E says like, oh well, what did you do prior to? This is how do you want to flavor the actual class and character? Bounty Hunter. That's you know it's gonna be what it is. You know, you're you're out to, to track people down as as you would expect. Uh, icon, you've you've done something of renown, so people actually know who you are. Um, you know, so this would kind of be close to your folk hero. Uh, now, again, all of these things 
will have the ability to alter your class because they give you a stat, they give you some other things. Um, so it can really help you define your character. You have mercenary, outlaw, priest, scholar, spacefarer, spacefarer, xeno seeker. Um, you know, there's a there's a big difference between spacefarer and xeno seeker, although they might sound similar. A spacefarer is you're looking to. Well, did you? I did. Greetings, everyone. Nathan Nerdark here from Nerdarchy for Nerds by Nerds, hanging out with a nerd. Nerdark is dead. And today we're going to be talking about the release of Starfinder from uh, Paizo, Pathfinder, normal Pathfinder providers. <laughs> so if you guys uh, want the link to, link is in the description. If you want to head over to Amazon and get any kind of awesome Starfinder products, it is an affiliate link. So, you know, we will get a portion of that sale. But you'll be still be able to get it at the Amazon great price, and there's a lot of stuff that's you know coming out over the next several months. So, yeah, yeah, it's a big it's a big launch. So I'm I'm excited because I I saw the game you, that you were in with uh, Cody from Taking Twenty and a few other a few other uh, players, right? And um, yeah. it was nice to get a sneak peek at it, and it, it was, was it was nice to see the different combat elements as well. Sorry, it is. It's definitely a you know, it's definitely a Pathfinder game. Uh, it's it's built off of that same engine. So if you are really into the, the Pathfinder aspect of, of the role-playing games, then you're going to absolutely love Starfinder. Um, you know, there's some things that I don't know whether that was unique to Starfinder or whether that's the way it is in Pathfinder as well. I'm not super familiar with the game. But, like, when you get into, like your hit points, you actually have hit points and stamina, and it's not until you actually get into like the, the one that that's really where you're taking damage, where stamina, I believe, is just your you know your your fortitude and how much energy you have. That you know that comes you know comes back faster than the actual hit points. Yeah, they did it in a way in which I had wished D and D five E had did it, which is separate the concept of actual damage have another thing that would go well with your stuff now uh we'll get into this you know this part later um but one of the things that i thought was fantastic was during uh the actual class breakdowns they actually give you for lack of a better word archetype so it's like oh well i want to mix you know this class with this theme and this is the rule books derivation of what the two of them you know make and i, I kind of thought that, that was that was really awesome because then while looking through the classes you could be like oh well here's an idea for a character and each of them already has a picture right there so if you really love what's right there you could be like okay well i've got my race my class and my theme picked just from just looking at that what was your opinion on that nate uh, I actually really enjoyed uh, the the complexity of it that you had you had a theme that pretty much felt like it could have been a class as well, but they didn't. I like that they didn't attach. I, I like how, for example, like ace an ace pilot doesn't have to be a fighting class. Right. You could be an ace pilot and be an icon, or like a diplomat or something like that, or some yeah. other. Well, no, I might be getting. I have to look at the rule book. But you know, you know, like a mechanic, you could be a pilot, a mechanic, or you could be any of the other actual classes and be an ace pilot. So it was. Um, I I always dislike how they how they how some um, future games would do that, where it was kind of like. You know, the fighting class had an archetype that was the ace pilot, and it's like, well, what if you just really like ships and you want to be a pilot, <laughs> and you also happen to do X, Y, or Z? Right. So it gives it. It's a nice mix because that means you can have an ace pilot that is, you know, five or go new places. So for you, it's more about the travel and where you go, whereas the Xeno Seeker is more about actually making contact with you know new life forms and and that so it's more like charisma based if you will and then here's something that they found or that they did that you know is kind of kind of unique or you know new they have a they have themeless so it's like oh you don't want a theme 
here you go. You can just make your character themeless. themeless. So you're going to get a, uh, since all of them give you some kind of skill, here, all right, you've got, you know, gain, gain a class skill of your choice when you create a themeless character, and you're going to be able to get an ability adjustment to anything that you want, as opposed to the other themes that give you specific stuff. And then as you gain gain levels, you're going to get those specific powers um, once per day before you roll a skill check. You can gain plus two bonus to that skill. Extensive studies. Choose a skill that is a class skill for you once per day. You can reroll one such skill check. You've got to take the, the second result. Uh, and then at 18th level, increase your, your pool of resolve points by one. Now, it specifically calls out that if you decide to go with a themeless character, they're telling you straight up that the stuff that you get for being themeless is less powerful than what's in those other uh, nine choices. So do it at your own risk. And it literally you know, says that a themeless character is considered less powerful than a character with a theme. So, this, so choose this option with care. So I, I kind of thought that was uh, that was pretty interesting. Yeah, when uh, they're calling it out that it's not it's not as good. Yeah, you want to only pick that if you absolutely don't have to your body and hit point damage that isn't actual damage to your body. So, um, because you know they talk about how for like the first well I don't want to get into another game system while we're talking about this one. But anyway, I like the way. Starfinder did hit points and stamina and how they how you gain stamina points over time as you level. Right. So it's it's one of those things that like I, I understand that you know fifth edition's reason for doing it being a little bit easier and not wanting to go into that, well, we've got two different things, but it would make for certain types of spells that you could say, Oh, well, if I want to go straight to hit point damage, that could be crazy. Hmm. Yes. So, uh, where did you want to start off with? Um, uh, I figured. I, I figured. Uh, you know, we could talk about the fact that, um, you know, Starfinder does kind of sort of have a a background, like like Fifth Edition has. So you've got the ability to choose a background. You got you have the ability to choose a race, and you have the ability to choose a class. So I figured we could go into you know, those things so that people could, you know, even if they don't have the book yet, you know, we could kind of help them make their first character choices, uh, you know, and that'll probably round out our, uh, you know, our hour. How do you feel about that, sir? Uh, that sounds good to me. So I actually have the PDF here, so we'll wind up doing some screen shares. Uh, So let's see here. Yeah, I have to wrangle some people, so I'll be right back. Yep. All right, so we get into character creation, and their background things they call themes. So 